Good evening. Welcome back to another edition of Billy Reads Books. I am Billy. Tonight we have part two of uh, chapter one of Toni Morrison's excellent novel, Beloved. In it, uh, Sethi is catching up with where we left off. Uh, Sethi is catching up with a old friend, a sweet home, named Paul D. And uh, they're talking about a child that haunts her literally. And um, also uh, her daughter, Denver, excuse me. Denver says, no, sir, said Denver. This is where we'll start. We have a ghost in here, she said, and it worked. They were not a twosome anymore. Her mother left off swinging her feet, being girlish. Memory of sweet home dropped away from the eyes of the man she was being girlish for. He looked quickly up at the swing at the lightning white stares behind her. So I hear, he said. It's sad, your mama said. Not evil. No, sir, said Denver. Not evil, but not sad either. What then? Rebuked, lonely and rebuked. Is that right? Paul D. turned to Sethi. I don't know about lonely, said Denver's mother. Mad, maybe. But I don't see how it could be lonely spending every minute with us like it does. Must be something you got it wants. Sethi shrugged. It's just a baby. My sister, said Denver. She died in this house. Paul D. scratched the hair under his jaw. <gasps> Reminds me of that headless bride back behind Sweet Home. Remember that, Sethi? Used to roam them woods regular. How could I forget? Worrisome. How come everybody run off from Sweet Home and can't stop talking about it? It looked like if it was so sweet, you would have stayed. Girl, who are you talking to? Paul D. laughed. True, true. She's right, Sethi. It wasn't sweet, and it sure wasn't home. He shook his head. But it's where we were, said Sethi, all together. Comes back whether we want it or not. She shivered a little. A, li a light ripple of skin on her arm, which she caressed back into sleep. Denver, she said, start up that stove. Can't have a friend stop by and don't feed him. Don't go into any trouble on my account, Paul D. said. Bread ain't trouble. The rest I brought back from when I work. Not from where I work. Least I can do, cooking from dawn to noon, is bring dinner home. You got any objections to Pike? If he don't object to me, I don't object to him. At it again, thought Denver. But back to them, she, was, uh, she jostled the kindling and almost lost the fire. Why don't you spend the night, Mr. Gardner? You and Mama, uh, you and Ma'am can talk about Sweet Home all night long. Sethi took two swift steps to the stove, but before she could yank Denver's collar, the girl leaned forward and began to cry. What is the matter with you? 
I never knew you to behave this way. Leave her be, said Paul D. I'm a stranger to her. That's just it. She got no cause to act up with a stranger. Oh, baby, what is it? Did something happen? But Denver was shaking now and sobbing, so she could not speak. The tears she had not shed for nine years, wetting her far too womanly breasts. I can't no more. I can't no more. Can't what? What can't you? I can't live here. I don't know where to go or what to do, but I can't live here. Nobody speaks to us. Nobody comes by. Boys don't like me. Girls don't either. Honey, honey. What's she talking about nobody speaks to you? Asked Paul D. It's the house. People don't. It's not. It's not the house. It's us. And it's you. Denver. Leave off, Seppy. It's hard for a young girl living in a haunted house. That can't be easy. It's easier than some things. Uh, it's easier than some other things. Think, Seppy. I'm a grown man with nothing new left to see or do. And I'm telling you, it ain't easy. Maybe you all ought to move. Who owns this house? Over Denver's shoulder, Seppy shot Paul D. a, a look of snow. What you care? They won't let you leave. No, they won't let you leave? No. Seppy. No moving. No leaving. It's all right the way it is. You going to tell me it's all right with this child half out of her mind? Something in the house braced, and in the listening quiet that followed, Seppy spoke. I got a tree on my back, and I hain't in my house, and nothing in between but the daughter I am holding in my arms. No more running, nothing. I will never run from another thing on this earth. I took one journey, and I paid for the ticket. But let me tell you something, Paul D. Gardner. It costs too much. Do you hear me? It costs too much. Now sit down and eat with us, or leave us be. Paul D. finished his... Uh, Paul D. fished in his vest for a little pouch of tobacco. Concentrating on its contents and the knot of its string, while Seppi led Denver into the keeping room that opened off a large room he was stirring in, he had no smoking papers, so he fiddled with the pouch and listened through the open door to Seppi quieting the daughter. When she came back, she avoided his look and went straight to a small table next to the stove. Her back was to him, and he could see all the hair he wanted without the distraction of her face. What tree on your back? Huh? Seppi put a bowl on the table and reached under it for a flower. What tree on your back? What do you mean? Mountain town. Tom Hanks. Who does? Tom Hanks has plenty of arms. Nothing from him. Okay. Good night. Oh God, he will come, Tom Hanks. Well, Tom Hanks. Paul D. fished in his vest for a little pouch of tobacco. 
concentrating on its contents and the knot of its string while Sethi led Denver into the keeping room that opened off the large room he was sitting in. He had no smoking papers, so he fiddled with the couch and listened through the open door to Sethi quieting her daughter. When she came back, she avoided his look and went straight to a small table next to the stove. Her back was to him, and he could see all the hair she wanted without the distraction of her face. What tree on your back? Huh? Sethi put a bowl on the table and reached under it for a flower. What tree on your back? Is something growing on your back? I don't see nothing growing on my back. Is there all the same? Who told you that? White girl. That's what she called it. I've never seen it and never will. But that's what she said it looked like. A choke cherry tree. Trunk, branches, even leaves. Uh, tiny little choke cherry leaves. But that was 18 years ago. Could have cherries too now for all I know. Sethi took a spit from the tip of her tongue with her forefinger. Quickly, lightly, she touched the stove. Then she trailed her fingers through the flower, parting, separating small hills and ridges of it, looking for mites. Finding none, she poured the she poured soda and salt into the crease of her folded hand and tossed both on into the flour. Then she reached into a can and scooped half a handful of lard. Deftly she squeezed the flour through it. Then with her left hand sprinkling with water, she formed the dough. I had milk, she said. I was pregnant with Denver, but I had milk for my baby girl. I hadn't stopped nursing her when I sent her on ahead with Howard and Bugler. Now she rolled the dough out with a wooden pin. Anybody could smell me long before he saw me. And when he saw me, he'd see the drops of it on the front of my dress. Nothing I could do about that. All I knew was I had to get my milk to my baby girl. Nobody was going to nurse her like me. Nobody was going to get it to her fast enough or take it away when she had had uh, when she had enough and didn't know it. Nobody knew that she couldn't pass her air if you held her up on your shoulder only if she was lying on my knees. Nobody knew that but me. Nobody had her milk but me. I told that to the woman in the wagon. I told them to put sugar water in my cloth to suck from. So when I got there in a few days, she wouldn't have forgotten me. The milk would be there, and I would be there with it. Men don't know nothing much, said Paul D., tucking his pouch back into his vest pocket. But they do know a suckling can't be away from its mother for long. Then they know what it's like to send your children off when your breasts are full. We was talking about a tree, Sethi. After I left you, those boys came in there and took my milk. That's what they came in there for. Held me down and took it. 
I told Mrs. Garner about him. He had that lump and couldn't speak, but her eyes rolled out. Uh, she had that lump and couldn't speak, but her eyes rolled out tears. Then boys found out I told on him. School teacher made one open up my back, and when it closed, it made a tree. It grows there still. They used cowhide on you, and they took my milk. They beat you, and you was pregnant, and they took my milk. The fat white circles of dough lined the pan in rows. Once more, Seffy touched a wet forefinger to the stove. She opened the oven door and slid the pan of biscuits in. She raised up from the heat. She felt Paul D. behind her and his hands under her breasts. She straightened up and knew, but could not feel that his cheek was pressing into the branches of her choke cherry tree. Not even trying, he had be become the kind of man who could walk into a house and make the women cry. Because with him, in his presence, they could. There was something blessed in his manner. Women saw him and wanted to weep, to tell him that their chest hurt and their knees did too. Strong women and wise saw him and told him things they only told each other. The way he passed the change of life, desire in them had suddenly become enormous, greedy, more savage than when they were fifteen, and that it embarrassed them and made them sad, that secretly they longed to die, to be quit of it, that sleep was more precious to them than any waking day. Young girls sidled up to him to confess or describe how well-dressed the visitations were that had followed them straight from their dreams. Therefore, although he did not understand why this was so, he was not surprised when Denver dripped tears into the stove fire, nor fifteen minutes later, after telling him about her stolen milk, her mother wept as well. Behind her, bending down, his body an arc of kindness, he held her breasts in the palms of his hands. He rubbed his cheek on her back and learned that was her sorrow, the roots of it its wide trunk and intricate branches. Raising his fingers to the hooks of her dress, he knew without seeing them or hearing any sigh that the tears were coming fast. And when the top of her dress was around her hips and he saw the sculpture her back had become, like the decorative work of an ironsmith too passionate for display. He could think but not say, ah, oh, Lord, girl. And he would tolerate no peace until he had touched every ridge and leaf of it with his mouth, none of which Seffi could feel because her back skin had been dead for years. What she knew was that the responsibility for her breasts, at least, 
was in somebody else's hands. Would there be a little space, she wondered, a little time, some way to hold off eventfulness, to push busyness into the corners of the room and just stand there a minute or two, naked from shoulder blade to waist, relieved of the weight of her breast, smelling the stolen milk again, and the pleasure of baking bread. Maybe this one time she could stop dead in, uh, she could stop dead still in the middle of a cooking meal. <sighs> middle of a cooking meal. Not even leave the stove and feel the hurt her back ought to. Trust things and remember things because the last of the sweet home men was there to catch her if she sang. The stove didn't shudder as it adjusted to its heat. Denver wasn't stirring in the next room. The pulse of red light hadn't come back, and Paul D. had not trembled since 1856, and then for 83 days in a row. Locked up and chained down, his hands shook so bad he couldn't smoke or even scratch properly. Now he was trembling again, but in the legs this time. It took him a while to realize that his legs were not shaking because of worry, but because the floorboards were and the grinding, shoving floor was only part of it. The house, it's, the house itself was pitching. Seffy slid to the floor and struggled to get back into her dress. Well, down on all fours, as though she was, as though she were holding her house down on the ground. Denver burst from the keeping room, terror in her eyes, a vague smile on her lips. God damn it, hush up. Paul D. was shouting, falling, reaching for an anchor. Leave the place alone. Get the hell out. A table rushed toward him, and he grabbed its leg. Somehow, he managed to stand at an angle, and, holding the table by two legs, he bashed it about, wrecking everything, screaming back at the screaming house. You want to fight? Come on! God damn it! She got enough without you! She got enough! The quaking slowed to an occasional lurch, but Paul D. did it not stop whipping the table around until everything was rock quiet. Sweating and breathing hard, he leaned against the wall in the space the sideboard left. Seffi was still crouched next to the stove, clutching her salvaged shoes to her chest. The three of them, Seffi, Denver, and Paul D., breathed to the same beat, like one tired person. Another breathing was just as tired. It was gone. Denver wandered through the silence to the stove. She ashed over the fire and pulled the pan of biscuits from the oven. The jelly cupboard was on its back its contents lying in a heap on the corner of the bottom shelf. She took out a jar and, looking around for a plate, found half of one by the door. And these things she carried out to the porch steps where she sat down. 
The two of them had gone up there, stepping lightly, easy-footed. They had climbed the white stairs, leading her down below. She pried the wire from the top of the jar and then the lid under the cloth and under that a thin cake of wax. She removed it all and coaxed the jelly onto one half of the half of a plate. She took a biscuit and pulled it uh, and pulled off its black top. Smoke curled of the soft white insides. She missed her brothers. Bugler and Howard would be twenty-two and twenty-three now. Although they had been polite to her during the quiet time and gave her the whole top of the bed, she remembered how it was before. The pleasure they had sitting clustered on the white stairs. She between the knees of Howard or Bugler, while they made up the dice rich. Stories with proven ways of killing her dead. And baby Suggs telling her things in the keeping room. She smelled like bark in the day and leaves at night. For Denver would not sleep in her old room after her brothers ran away. Now her mother was upstairs with the man who had gotten rid of the only other company she had. Denver dipped a bit of bread into the jelly. Slowly, methodically, miserably, she ate it. And that concludes part two of chapter one of Beloved by Toni Morrison. Thank you for tuning in. I'll catch you on the flip-flop and see you next week.